we're going to continue in our study through the book of Acts, guys. If you have your Bibles or you want to follow along with your devices. Acts chapter 26. We want to invite all the men out to come out for our uh, Saturday morning men's prayer time. It's always a rousing time. Uh, we're blessed to have uh, John leading worship on sun Saturday morning, so it, uh, it's, it's a double dose of blessing. We worship and we get to pray and we uh, go through a little devotional. But again, uh, 7.30 here at the chapel, guys, join us. Uh, Acts chapter 26, Acts chapter 26. I was checking out the guys when they come in, and I saw that Jay had surf shorts on, so I said, oh, okay, I, I know where he's heading after. He's going to hit the surf rather than watch the game, I think. <laughs> he might choke, choke some food down and then go hit the surf, so I don't know. <laughs> but Acts chapter 26, guys, and we're, we're coming through a, t uh, a tough portion of Scripture in both our midweek and Sunday morning services. And why I say it's tough, it's really a tough thing. Uh, we've seen uh, the downward spiral of Ahab, the king of Israel, as his heart and position was hardened over and over against the Lord. You know, the Lord had reached out to him time and time again. And here the Lord in his great love, he reaches out to even the, the toughest guys. He reaches out to all the boneheads, all the knuckleheads, all the hardheads. And I'm glad that God didn't give up on us because I think that, you know, probably we think that each one of us, hey, we were kind of in that same state. We might not say we were a knucklehead or a hardhead, but, you know, maybe our hearts were hardened toward the Lord. Maybe we're looking so good on the outside and, you know, we look all nice and washed up and, oh, what a nice, decent person. But on the inside, hey, there was a lot of things uh, within the heart that caused a separation. And you know, Jeremiah said, it's, it's that sin that separates you. You know, it's that sin that separates you from the Lord. And you know, we don't enjoy that fellowship. But it seemed that there was no amount of reason that, the, 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 uh, that would bring him about. The Lord said in Isaiah, come let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. And, you know, this is the same people that Isaiah was reaching out to, the same crowd of people and the same crowd of people in the world today. He says, hey, let's, let us reason. Let's be reasonable. Let's sit down. Let's talk about it. Let's, let's, uh, let's share what the Lord can do for you. And though they are red as crimson, they, will, they, would, be as, uh, uh, they would be like wool. You know, he says that, yeah, I'm going to wash you and I'm going to cleanse you. And the Lord desires that, you know, even though our hands might have been stained, even though our hands might have been bloodied, uh, you know, God is uh, a God and a Savior for those, even th for those who have killed, those who have murdered, those who have robbed. And, you know, you might not have the sin. You might have the little sin of a white lie. You might have the little sin of, oh, that, that bad guy, oh, that lady, oh, she's so such and such. But, you know, we think that way, and then, you know, it, it, we, we don't... Uh, we, we cavalierly sin, and we don't even really think it's a sin. And we just, uh, we just move on. <clears throat> but you see, the long-suffering of God and the, his, call, his recalling out to man like Ahab and to the Roman leaders Paul is now dealing with. Paul, is the, Paul has gone through all these things of all the sharing with all the crowds, all the people that he got together in the synagogues, all the guys that he met up with and all the guys who wanted to kill him. And now he's, uh, you know, now he's in the hands of the Roman leaders. In Acts 25, we saw the charges that were brought up against Paul. And we'll pick up our study today in 26, chapter 1, Acts 26, chapter 1. And Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak to yourself. And then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. Paul, after, uh, after hearing the charges, Agrippa now allows Paul to bring up his own defense. And Agrippa, like that good Roman ruler, was very uh, uh, just in the fact that, hey, you're a Roman citizen, Paul. You have every right to stand before this tribunal and to give an account and to give a defense of these charges that your fellow Jews have brought against you. 
what's this all about, Paul? And, uh, you know, in the, in the prim and properness of Roman law and order, Agrippa followed that to a T. He went on, in regard to all the things of which I am accused of by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, Agrippa, because I am to make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Paul opens up with a nice and gen uh, genuous greeting. He says, hey, thank you for your time, King. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for the things that you're going to hear from me today. He's affording the King all the respect and all the acknowledgement of his Jewish background. You see, uh, Agrippa was not only a Roman king, you know, a king by the Roman uh, government. He was not only uh, in line to this line of Herod the Great, you know, he was in line with Herod, uh, but he was also had some Jewish background. You know, his mom or his grandma was a Jewish, uh, a Jewish uh, woman to where hey, a lot of times the kids who raised them up, it was really the moms that went ahead and spoke into the hearts and ears of the little children. Like we do today, we might do today. You might be praying, you might be speaking to the child in the womb of another uh, a pregnant woman and just saying that, hey, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. You might be reading to that unborn child the gospel message, the scriptures, just trusting and believing, hey Lord, you can take that word of God and speak into the heart and the child of, the, uh, of that unborn child. In faith, we bring our kids to the Lord. In faith, we bring them in dedication, saying and acknowledging, Lord, you have given me this child. Lord, you, we are accountable for the life of this child and raising up this child. And a lot of times, uh, guys like myself, will put the onus back, we will turn the onus back upon the parents and saying that, hey, the Lord has given you this child for so many years. You might think that you might go for 18 years and your responsibility is over. Well, it's not. But, uh, uh, you, you know, you, you still feel that responsibility and you still, in your heart, you're still sharing the encouragements of God's word with your grandchildren. You're still sharing with them uh, the things that, oh, grandma's praying for you, grandpa's praying for you, auntie's praying for you, uncle is praying for you. And these things, he's saying that, you know, I acknowledge, uh, uh, Agrippa, that you have knowledge of uh, the, the great God of heaven, the one and the true God. And he says, there, uh, especially, uh, and, and uh, so then the Jews know my manner of life from youth up, uh, from which um, from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem. Since they have known me for a long time previously, they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. Paul doesn't miss a beat. He starts out at the beginning, uh, he, he, his own upbringing, his history as far as the religious training, and uh, this is where I came from. Hey, I'm, I'm a Pharisee. I'm one of the religious uh, leaders of the nation of Israel. I came up with the strictest traditions. I came up on the, the, the most rigorous uh, teachings of some of the best teachers. This is my story. This is where I come from. And, you know, again, we come back to, hey, that having that two-minute testimony, as Greg Laurie would say, hey, have a two-minute testimony that you can share with somebody that you come into contact with. Even if you're going down to do counseling at a crusade, you know, hey, maybe you can just share a moment. Hey, this is where I was. Hey, God delivered me from all this mess I was in, and he can do the same for you because of his love and his faithfulness. He took me, he rescued me, he washed me, he cleansed me, he straightened my life up because I was pretty uh, broken and pretty busted up. But Paul went on in 6, he says, Now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made to God, uh, to our fathers. And how, now he begins all the promises of the prophets. He takes the, the, the uh, Agrippa right back to the original uh, writings of the prophets of the coming Messiah. And all the anticipation as the, uh, uh, as the table at Passover had a place setting for the Savior. Remember the Passover meal? They, they had the meal, the family had the meal. They went through all the ritual. They went through all the washings. They went through all the prescribed foods described under the, uh, under the, the law and the regulations of the cleansings and the washings and the so on. 
But you know, they had one empty place setting at the table. It was like, we're expecting a, guest, a visitor. We're expecting a guest. You know what they were expecting? They were expecting the Messiah, yes. They were expecting the Messiah. And I think this, I believe this tradition still goes on where they have the, uh, uh, the Passover meal and that, that, that table setting is still empty, still awaiting. They're not going to say Jesus, not unless they're a completed Jew and they've come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But for those who are waiting the coming of the Messiah, they're going to say, hey, we're waiting for the Messiah. We're waiting for the Savior. And you know, the, 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 the sad thing is that they missed all the things, all the little cues, all the little details uh, given by the uh, prophets of the coming Messiah. All came to a place of reality in my, in my heart and mind on a fateful day on the Damascus road, he says, he told Agrippa. All this came to play, all the things that I've learned about, all the things that I hid in my heart and mind as a kid about the coming Messiah, all of a sudden the Messiah was revealed to me. And all of a sudden, you know, one time, one day, one fateful moment, wherever you were, you could have been on the continent of the USA, you could have been on one of the outer islands, you could have been, I don't know where you could be. You could be, you know, in the silence of your own heart, in the darkness of bed, the nighttime, or you're gazing up into the heavens. And you, you, you start talking to yourself, or re, are you really talking to yourself? Is there really something about this Savior? Is there really something about this Jesus that these people are telling me about? Those people, <laughs> you know, we, we put them in a, a category. But all of a sudden, the reality of those people came closer to home as the reality of a Savior uh, became revealed to you, however it might be through the brightness of the, the, star, the sun in the morning, through the shooting stars at night, like answering every question that you fire up. Are you there? Right? Yeah, I'm sure I am. You know, here I am. But it's a, it, in the promise to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, I have been accused by the Jews. Uh, why, uh, why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. We earnestly uh, awaited, he says, King, for the coming of the Lord. But he had appeared in a manner spurious to our people. And we couldn't believe that he was going to be born in some stable. We couldn't believe that he was going to be born in some, to some backwards carpenter and a poor servant slave girl, his mother, you know, and uh, we couldn't believe that. But he and Amir uh, appeared in a manner spurious to our people. We just couldn't believe the message. And in this, we missed entirely, completely his coming. You know, who did Jesus, uh, 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 he didn't appear at the, the Trump Tower, now rebranded the Kalai Tower. He didn't appear there. He didn't come with lights and fireworks and all the big press. And, oh, here's the first child. Oh, here's the Messiah being born. Oh, here's the first baby of the new year. Here's the first baby of the new, the coming of the Messiah, the new millennia. And uh, we earnestly awaited, and we're still awaiting the coming of the uh, uh the Lord. We're ready. We're ready to serve Him. We're ready to worship Him. We're ready to have services at a temple should it ever get rebuilt, you know. This is where a lot of the Jews are today. They are waiting the coming Messiah. They are waiting someone who's going to say, hey, we're going to come and we're going to allow you to rebuild your temple. We're going to de uh, declare a moratorium on all the warfare ongoing within the city of Jerusalem. And we're going to allow you to build, and we're going to allow you to sacrifice, and we're going to allow you to worship your God for three and a half years at least. But in, in just, uh, in, this is what I did in uh, Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And you remember Stephen, you know, uh, the, the Jews laid their cloaks at the feet of, uh, of Paul. And Paul was in hearty agreement as they stoned Stephen to death. 
you know, and uh, you know, he was right there. It's just as much as he threw the first stone because he was in hearty agreement. He would write to the Romans that, hey, if we so are, are so agreeable with these things that are ongoing in the things of the world, hey, we become part and parcel. We can become just as guilty as those participating in that, you know, so. So when you look at uh, uh, a lot of the violence on TV and stuff like that, you think that, hey, do you really want to be part and parcel of what the world is selling to uh, the, our people, to most of the world? But he says, I myself was a great persecutor of the church and those who believe this message of grace. I pursued them, uh, those who believed. I beat confessions out of them. I voted to put them to death. And you know, there's that thing, you know, where you, where you think that, hey, I've seen that in the movies, you know, it's either a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And hey, if you got the thumbs down, that was it. You had it, man. And uh, it wasn't a pleasant thing. But while thus engaged, I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. And at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why is it hard for you to kick against the goads? And uh, I, I said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But arise and stand on your feet for this purpose. I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to those things which you have seen, but also to the things which will appear to you, delivering you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who have been sanctified uh, by faith in me. He says, hey, Lord, uh, yeah, uh, Agrippa, I was minding my own business, King Agrippa, proceeding on my mission to track down those Christians, those people. You like that? Those people, those, those dirty, rotten scoundrels, those dirty, rotten thieves, those dirty, rotten murderers, those dirty, rotten Christians in that same light, in that same vein. All of a sudden, a bright light appeared and a voice from heaven spoke these words. Why do you kick against the goads, Paul? And we, we remember that goads were those sharp pointed sticks that kind of goaded the, the, the labor, uh, the, the oxen who were laboring, pulling the uh, plow and stuff like that. They goad them with these sharp pointed sticks and they keep moving and they keep moving. And it was like uh, the Lord was using these, uh, these little prickly points to get Paul's attention, but he kept kicking against the goads. He said, no, no, no. No, Lord. And, it, you know, sometimes you, you think of little kids. Kids are like that. You know, that at two years old, no matter what you tell them, when they learn that word, no, it's no. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing. And, you know, they, they think that all of a sudden it's no. And this was, a, this was Paul's mission. I asked who he was, and he answered Jesus. And he instructed me of what I was to do. Number one, he says that I was to minister and to witness for all I saw. You know, for, for what uh, Paul says that, hey, whatever the Lord had shown me, whatever he revealed to me, I was to be a witness and to minister to, to all those I came along to. And, you know, if we, we take that a step further and we think about Jesus himself in his last, uh, his last instructions to his disciples, he said, go therefore into all the nations, into all the world, you know, into uh, your, your uh, uh, Judea, Sumeria, uh, to the endless parts of the world and, and minister for me in my name and tell them uh, 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 what I have done. Tell them what we know. Tell them what we have seen. And these things, have, uh, uh, you know, we, it's carried on today because we still have, you know, missionaries, mission teams going on around the world. And we have mission teams coming from around the world, maybe to the U.S., because, hey, we're closing up churches and people are turning away from the Lord quicker than they're receiving the Lord, it almost seems like. 
and uh, we we are instructed to minister and be a witness for him for all that he's seen. He says number two is to bring deliverance to both Jew and to Gentile. God is not a, a, a lover of one man. He doesn't say I love the Jews and I hate the, uh, I, I hate the uh, Hamas and I hate the Palestinians and I hate these guys, I hate that. God is a lover of all mankind and do you think that uh, his heart doesn't break for all the scenes that the, 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 the terrorists show on TV and really the, their own people become a political pawn their own people become a shield, a human shield for the things that are ongoing. Their own people die for the uh, furtherance of their own gospel and their own things that they are undertaking. Uh, he says to turn them from darkness to light. And I, I know that, uh, I don't know about you, there are guys that love the darkness, we, we like the darkness. You look at this light and give me my shades and uh, I had a friend, uh, you know, I, I, I knew a guy, we were in uh, Foodland, and Foodland is brightly lit, and, you know, a lot of fluorescent lights and everything like that, but when I looked into his eye, he quickly grabbed for his sunglasses. He put on his shades. You know why? He, he didn't want to reveal what was behind those eyes. He didn't want to reveal the question. He didn't want to reveal the hurt. He didn't want to reveal, maybe it was a semblance of guilt for the things that he had done, I don't know. But sometimes we want to hide behind those glasses and you know, uh, uh, darkness hates, doesn't like the light. It's like the roaches at night, you know, we, we got to deal with these cockroaches here in Honolulu and a lot of times you turn the light on, you see the roaches scatter. But the roaches love the darkness and you know, that's how sin is. We love the darkness, and you could find yourself under a tree, under the street lamp, so there's no light shining on you. And you know, these are the things that we do. Somebody identified with that, <laughs> hiding from the sunlight. <laughs> but he says, from bringing people to darkness to light and to deliver from the strange hold, from the stranglehold of Satan. Can you believe that? Hey, hey, Russell, I can breathe okay. Nothing's wrong with me. You know, I can, I, can, I can take a breath in, breathe in, breathe out, up, down with the strokes of the brush and so on and so forth. But you know, really, state, Satan had his hand on our, our necks and he wanted to keep us there. He wanted to keep us down. He wanted to keep us in the muck. He wanted to keep us in the mire. Wherever we were, he wanted the control over us. He wanted uh, his, his fingers on our neck. And to receive forgiveness of sins, that's the biggest thing, yeah? Again, the, the, the burden of sin, the weight of sin, the sin that held us down. And you know, I hate to be redundant because Paul has shared the same message with the rest of the leaders, Felix and Festus. And I think that, hey, Lord, how come you're repeating the same thing, the testimony of Paul over and over? Is it to remind us that we need to be able to share our testimony with others? Or is it a reminder that this is what you have done? Or is it a re reminder of uh, those here together this morning, we needing to hear that, that he delivered us from that, that he, he has a plan for our lives. He, ha he has a plan to forgive us to wash us and to cleanse us, even as, as uh, Isaiah said, I'm gonna make you whiter than snow. You know, come let us reason, though your sins are as scarlet. You know, I wanna wash you whiter than snow. And he says, you know, and to receive an, an inheritance in me, in me, Christ Jesus. What is that inheritance, guys? Is it, is it gold, silver, diamonds, jewels, and all that? I had one guy, he used to say, oh, I have, uh, I, I'm going to get a couple pounds of rubies when I get to heaven. <laughs> but I think what he was trying to say that is, I have an inheritance in heaven that is far beyond any wealth that we could ever think we imagine. Of all this other stuff, it's all going to burn, right? You know, back, back in those days, the saying was, it's all going to burn. Like, hey, wh why, why are you holding on to this? Why you, why you work so hard for this? Why you cherish this? Why do you favor this? Why do you chase after this? Because it's all going to burn. And you think, wow, let me enjoy it for a little. Let me spend a little bit. <laughs> but you know, you, you, you think that 
it, it is. It's one day it's going to come, like Peter says, it's going to come like a roaring fire, you know, just ripping through. And things are going to just burn up. And, you know, uh, uh, burning has a way of bringing judgment. Burning has a way of bringing cleansing. Burning has a way of just saying that, hey, everything is, we're on an equal level, uh, equal playing field now. You don't have more than me. I don't have more than you. I don't have less than you. You don't have less than me. But he says that that inheritance we have is in Christ Jesus. He lays up uh, treasures in heaven, he says, for those who are in Christ Jesus. In fact, he already sees us seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So when you go to the Aloha Week Parade and you see them starting out somewhere here in downtown, and they, they're making their way down Alamoana Boulevard and down Kalakawa Boulevard, know that Jesus knows the beginning from the end. He knows where they started. And he already sees them finished at the, at the Kapilani Park bandstand where they finish. And you know, for you and me, guys, he, he knows where we started. He sees us going and he knows where our, the finish line is for us. Those treasures laid up for us in heaven. We're going to be seated around the throne, Lord. Uh, you know, with Him, uh, throwing our crowns at the throne. Hey, we have no crowns. We have all this. We give you everything, Lord. And this is what it is. But in 19, He says, Consequently, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient uh, to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those in Damascus first, also at Jerusalem, and then throughout the region of Judea, even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. He says, because of this king, I have followed through to the word of God. You know, in his mind, Paul had really followed through with God's word. In his own mind, he had followed through with what the, the, the prophets had spoken. He had followed through with what the Lord had commanded him. And he was guy... Uh, he was on a mission to uh, proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and to uh, uh, follow through with the Lord, what, what the Lord had instructed him to. He was one that says that, you know, you, the thought that is one much forgiven, much is required. You know, and he thought that, you know, I'm the chiefest of the sinners, Lord. And that's why I got to give, I got to serve, I got to give you everything I got. And all the hard feelings, all the things of hurt feelings, all the things of, oh, you know, I, 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 I don't like the way the game is going. I'm going to take my ball. I'm going to go home, you know. Maybe my mom has some hot cocoa for me and some Kleenex to, to wipe my nose. <laughs> and, you know, the, you know uh, Jeremiah said it rightly. If you cannot run with the, the footman, how are you going to run with the, the chariots? He says, hey, the race is tough. He says, you gotta, if you cannot run with the guys on foot, how are you going to run against the horses and the chariots? And you know, see, you know, life, life gets tough. We get hurt, we get bust up, we get beat up. People talk stink. People ignore you. People do this, people do that. They shine you on, whatever it might be. It might take a long many years before healing takes place to where you, you know, maybe the Lord says, hey, go back and share with those guys now. You know, you don't know. But you know, God, God is the one opening doors. God is the one saying that, hey, follow through, Paul. Be as Paul, you know. Uh, he, he didn't take all those beatings, all those threats, all those things so seriously. He kept going on. And, you know, of course the Lord says, hey, don't worry, Paul, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be my, my witness, my, my, uh, my minister uh, from here all the way to Rome, and I'm going to be with you. And no matter where your Rome is or my Rome is, guys, God has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. And, you know, we can be rabid for the gospel. We can be rabid for many things, you know, guys, uh, you know, guys have their sports, their interests, their girls, their hobbies, and whatever it might be. But, you know, God has promised never to leave us, nor forsake us. And He's always with us in those times. And uh, Lavon, Lavon just asked me, oh, what, are you, what, what did you used to do on Super Bowl Sunday? I told her, ride my bike. <laughs> 
because no traffic, hardly any traffic, and I had the road was open. And she said, oh, yeah, I remember going around the island with you on a Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> but, you know, here's the thing, guys, you know, whatever, whatever it is, you know, uh, we know that uh, God is with us. If he's with us, who, who can be against us? And, you know, the things of the world, the things of the guys who are against us, eh, hey, Paul said, I blackened my own eyes that I might not sin against you. So, you know, for him to get blackened and beaten and beaten and stoned by these worldly guys, it was no big deal. He says, hey, I'm going to go on. I'm going to carry the message. I got the ball, Lord. I got the ball. I'm going to take the ball. But in 21, he says, for this reason, some Jews were so, seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. And because I spoke of uh, Jesus, Agrippa, and uh, shared this message, the same message that I'm sharing with you, the Jews disavowed me. In other words, hey, we have no, nothing to do with you, Paul. In fact, you're such a bad guy. You should die. It's kind of like, well, some people feel like that about the Jews now. They have no right to live. We're going to push them right into the sea. You know, there is no two-party solution. The one-party solution is we live, you die. You know, that's uh, the feeling of some of these uh, leaders. Uh, but here we go on. And having uh, obtained help from God, I, I stand this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses was, uh, said was going to take place. Hey, I got nothing more to say. These guys, it's all written in the book, man that the Christ was to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he should be first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. He says, it's only by God that I stand before you today, King. As he allowed me to speak of him to all people about his death, about his resurrection from the dead. You know, there's no question about it, Lord. Uh, and uh, while Paul was saying this in defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, are you out of your mind? Your great learning is driving you mad. And uh, uh, Festus, while on the side listening, couldn't handle anymore, accusing Paul of being insane. And you know, uh, I've had guys tell me that. Oh, he said, oh, my guys from my school, they said that he really went over the deep end because now he's a Christian. <laughs> now he's preaching Jesus. And, but, but after uh, the testimony and the ministry and the witness of his life stood for many years, now, now the guys are listening. Now these guys, they're all high-powered, a lot of high-powered business guys, judges, attorneys, and all this and that. They're all listening to this one scraggly guy who was really messed up when he was young. <laughs> Somehow he graduated, somehow he went into college, somehow he played a little pro ball, somehow, you know, he landed on his feet only with the help of Jesus Christ. And now they're listening. You know, and now they're, they're saying that, hey, maybe there is something about this Jesus. And if you hear it enough and God, the Holy Spirit, comes and witnesses and ministers to you and speaks to your heart and brings other people into your life, you might think that, wow, what a coincidence. How come I'm meeting all these guys? How come I met, met this pastor? How come I'm meeting these guys sharing the gospel with me? And they, they're not like these, uh, the guys that first shared the gospel with me. They're more like my, my type of people. <laughs> but God knows who's going to speak into their hearts. God knows. The ministry of his Holy Spirit. It's only by God that I stand before you today. And uh, he says, I'm not mad. He, uh, Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I could speak to him also about, with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things exca ex escape his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Oh, hey, here he really probes deeply. He says, hey. Paul, he's just unwavering in his calm and coolness, just simply speaks, I utter words of truth. He says, I know the king knows about these matters. Hey, isn't it that, that, that direct? 
He's saying that, hey, I know you know about this. I know you know about that. And it, it, it kind of uh, 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 wants a response. It kind of, kind of wants a reply. It kind of wants a response to those words. Paul somehow had insight that Agrippa knew more about the Lord of God and perhaps even Jesus. It's because of that I speak with confidence that he will acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior. He comes straight out and asks the, kings if, uh, the king, if you, do you believe in the prophets? You know, apparently, maybe he was acquainted with the, the writings of the prophets. He says, speak about boldness. Paul doesn't hold back, asking direct questions that require direct answers or direct thoughts within the heart and mind of this king. I remember this, this, uh, this Herod Agrippa, he was a bad guy. He comes from a bad family. And you might think that, hey, I don't want to share with that guy. You don't know. My father warned me about his family. He said, don't mess with that family, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you kind of think that, hey, do I want to stick my neck out and share the gospel or do, it, do the words of your father? Say, hey, don't mess with that family. When you press and you probe and you ask those telling questions, I know you believe, King. I know you do. And King Agrippa uh, re replied to Paul, in a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. I don't know if uh, uh, Agrippa said that in a sarcastic tone. You think it was sarcastic or, or gentle? What do you guys think? You know, I know that as the, as the word speaks to each of our hearts, there might be a tone of sarcasm for some. It might, there might be a tone that says, hey, maybe I'll think about it. There might be a tone that says, okay, uh, you're not going to die, but I'll think about it. Or is it possible that there was a, uh, that he was on a cusp of decision, was a grip on that cusp of this decision of just being pushed over the edge? You might recall that. You might know that it was a friend sitting down with you just quietly, just a couple of guys. And they just ask you, hey, you want to receive the Lord? Point out, nobody else around. You, me, and Jesus. <laughs> and you come to your, your Jesus, your Jesus uh, moment, your time with Jesus. How do you respond? How have we responded? I want to, I want, I'd like to say that for us here today, hopefully we've all responded saying yes to Jesus and maybe... Uh, if we've been out of sync, out of touch, what it might be, we might say that, hey, I need to reconnect, Lord. I need to get back in tune with you. I need to re-engage. I always think about shoving that, that shifter into first gear, engage, step on the clutch, engage the gear, and, and, and start moving in the things of the Lord, going forward in the things of the Lord. Not backwards, but forward. But in 29, uh, uh, in 29, uh, Paul said, I would, uh, I would to God that whether in a short time or long, only you, you also, all who hear me this day, might become such as I am, except for these chains. Paul says, hey, I was uh, probably, Paul was very probably sincere in his desire for those who heard him to receive the Lord. And he says that, hey, my hope, my desire, my prayer is for each one of you, that you would come to know the Lord. Maybe those who uh, led you to the Lord, hey, they're long gone. You don't know where they are. You don't know if they're even alive. But they had all these high hopes and aspirations, and I, I, I think that, hey, you guys are, you guys are, what do you want? How do you see these things? How do you know these things? And, you know, you think that, what do you imagine such things? Where do you get an imagination for such things? And now, many years after the fact, you, you think that, hey, there was something to what they thought. There was something to what they saw. There was something to that thought that, hey, God has a plan for your life. Each and every one of us, God has a plan for your life. Well, in conclusion, the king arose and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with him. And when they were drawn aside, they began talking to one another, saying, this man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not, been, uh, if he had not appealed to Caesar. 
The conclusion was that Paul was not guilty of any kind of capital crime. He wasn't guilty of any kind of crime to put him in jail either, to put it that way. He indeed had grounds to stand upon and firm in his belief and commitment to Christ, yet not guilty uh, against the law of God and the law of the temple. You know, he was, uh, he was free and clear of that. And uh, they said that he has, uh, we have no grounds to hold him. We have no reason to hold him. And, you know, they, they're going to say that, hey, if Paul had an appeal to Caesar, we might have set him free. But because the appeal process is already in process, because Caesar probably already has heard about this problem, this man, he's heard about all this disturbance ongoing in Jerusalem and following this man from Jerusalem all the way to Caesarea, the Roman capital of Judea. You know, I've heard all about this. And now bring this man before me because I want to hear it before uh, what's going on with this man. And uh, fascinating life, the life of Paul, and fascinating life, uh, the ministry that the Lord had set him on. And uh, if you have a son or a grandson or whatever it is, you know, you might think that, hey, Paul is a good name. Paul is not such a bad name. And uh, uh, same thing with, uh, you know, we got a lot of good characters, you know, in, uh, in the Bible. But let's pray. Father God, we do want to thank you for this morning. We thank you for the reminders you bring of your faithfulness and love, Lord. We thank you that it's no problem for you to remind us of men's testimonies, Lord. And it's no re a problem for you to remind us about our testimonies, about what you've done and the work that you've completed on the cross on our behalf. We thank you for your saving grace and your washing and your cleansing. We thank you that your tender mercies are new for us each and every morning and new for us this day. We ask you bless the rest of our day, Lord, as we com continue to worship you now through uh, praise and worship, Lord, through the fellowship, through the food we're going to receive and the fellowship we enjoy this afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen and amen.